Hello, everyone, and welcome to Pricing Matters. Today, we have our first internal guest, our co-founder and CEO, Marcin Chicon. Welcome, Marcin. Thanks for being with us. Uh, thank you for having me, Gabe. It's my pleasure. We're really honored to have you as a guest. So for the listeners that are not familiar with price effects and the price effects story, can you tell us what price effects does and a little bit about how you came to start the company and why you did it? Sure. Um, uh, it's actually uh, quite unexpected, uh, I guess, but it's actually my grandma's fault. Uh, you know, uh, she was the early source of uh, the inspiration that ultimately defined my professional life. And because of her today, I believe in three foundational things that are absolutely key to to funding and running a successful business. Um, you know, one of those three is uh, just being a different in everything what you do. The second one is being excellent in everything what you do. And the uh, the other one is to be passionate about everything what you do. And, uh, you know, it's hard to believe that uh, about 10 years ago when we when we started the business, um, uh, you know, in our industry, the generation one uh, vendors have not embraced any of the of the concepts that are ab absolutely uh, normal today, like, uh, you know, SaaS, uh, software as a service uh, or cloud. And, uh, and they were heavily undifferentiated, um, lousy in, uh, in their execution and the way how they, how they serve their customers. And uh, honestly, very, very far away from being passionate. Um, and that's where I saw our big chance. And that's uh, how PriceFX was born. Can you describe for the listeners what PriceFX is and what we do? Absolutely. Uh, PriceFX is a, is a cloud-based cloud SaaS uh, provider of pricing solutions in the broadest possible sense. So we're trying to cover every aspect of pricing uh, that is not only uh, focusing on punctual resolution of solutions in the area of pricing, uh, you know, opportunity detection, or analytics, or price setting, or, uh, or in some other space, CPQ. But we, we see this very, very holistically, and, uh, and we cover the full spectrum of the pricing functionality and solutions that we that we that we provide so starting from from analytics through optimization ai based optimization uh, moving into a definition of price definitions price setting execution of pricing um, uh, you know to towards the the discount and promotion management uh, moving you know throughout the uh, the, the waterfall uh, to aspects of uh, of pricing like rebate management, uh, channel management, which is uh, popularly also called ship and debit, uh, through to quoting uh, execution of the classical CPQ, uh, where the loop is closing, and uh, you know, and all that is what we do day in day out. Um, as I said before, as a native cl native cloud uh, provider, um, and uh, on the basis of software as a service approach. So having come from you know, one of the Gen 1 providers that you talked about there. Um, I can tell you that, you know, there's a reason uh, that I'm here and that I think price effects is really truly delivering on the opportunity that exists. Um, but I'd like to talk about, you know, something more topical or more, more recent, which is, you know, taking a look back at 2020, which was, you know, a wild and challenging one in many ways. Uh, and I wanted to talk about, you know, as a leader of a company and also as, as someone that interacts a lot with our customers and sees the challenges that they're facing, um, can you talk about, you know, some of those those challenges and how we responded to them and how we helped our customers th get through 2020 and Excel? Absolutely. Well, uh, 2020 was quite a ride indeed, um, uh, but one that turned out to be quite positive for price effects. And there is uh, definitely, uh, you know, reasons for that. And I'm very grateful for that. Um, our customers have been challenged uh, with very, very sudden and uh, massive shift um, you know, in the way how they do business, um, how they sell their goods and services, um, you know, traditional channels that uh, have been in place and have been used uh, by many of them, uh, you know, all of a sudden vanished and uh, a new opened up um, and digitalization really became uh, became key. Um, and, uh, you know, we are by the nature at the forefront. At, at the forefront of the digitalization. We are the native cloud-based uh, service in our industry. Uh, we're not requiring any investments and can operate 100% virtually. That's why, you know, it, it is pretty much the time of our life, to be honest. Um, you know, all that increasing demand for, uh, for digital commerce solutions, uh, you know, for dynamic pricing, supporting multiple channels of, uh, you know, of the distribution of uh, the goods and services of our customers, in combination with, you know, a very compelling value proposition that, uh, you know, is resulting from pricing, uh, which, you know, we offer and we are really good at, 
okay. uh, let us uh, grow and expand despite the, uh, you know, the right, uh, rather challenging economic environment. So uh, I am really sorry to see many of our customers and businesses out there struggling um, uh, and, and this situation being actually pretty advantageous for us. Uh, but yes, we actually use the, the moment, uh, the opportunity the moment provided to us and uh, through the fact that we're providing those solutions that are at the forefront and the core of the current di digitalization wave, uh, we, we had actually pretty good here. We just had our 10th anniversary, right? It was a big, big celebration that we did. Uh, and obviously it was a virtual one. We would have loved to be together. But, you know, over the last decade, I think we've done a lot to disrupt our industry uh, and we've done a lot of innovation. Um, when we look at the next decade, can you talk about, you know, 2021 and beyond 2022, you know, the next the, looking forward right at our company and at pricing and pricing software in general? Can you talk about your vision for the, the company and the space and what you see happening? Absolutely. I mean, we uh, we definitely have a big and bid and very bold plans and uh, and we are very ambitious. Uh, we created what we do today for a reason. Um, and uh, the, the clear target of our strategy is to become very, very soon something what I call a mega vendor in the pricing uh, solution space. Um, very similar to what uh, Salesforce accomplished, you know, 15, 20 years ago uh, in, in CRM, something what Workday accomplished in HR and, and finance uh, SaaS solutions and uh, what, what currently Coupa is, is achieving in SRM. Uh, you know, 2021 and the years ahead of us, um, I'm absolutely sure of it, uh, offer a massive opportunity for us because the trends I just talked about, uh, you know, will only increase. Um, and demand of the digital and uh, and especially pricing solutions that I said before, which are in the core and, and forefront of the digitalization, um, I expect will go through the roof. And the company that is best prepared to respond to this increased demand and grab a massive uh, or the largest share of the market is price effects and that's why i believe uh, the future is great for us and we definitely are on the on the on the on the on the way to become the the mega vendor in the industry uh, and dominant player great and what would you say are the risks for companies that don't digitally transform their pricing or commercial strategy or quote to cash processes that's a lot of what we help companies do, and we see the benefits of it. But for maybe people that haven't gone through it or just looking at this, can you talk about, you know, what that what that means for these companies and what it means if they don't do that from a competitive standpoint? Well, it's it's generally it's exactly what what is happening to companies that then don't go with the you know with the, with the demand uh, or what needs to be done to respond to the market changes and the current challenges. Uh, they will be just left behind. Uh, there is no way the company can continue to manage the, comp the increasing complexity, which, uh, you know, their current environment and also the challenges that are ahead of us. And I am absolutely convinced that the economy and the environment and, and society will present us with some unexpected turns like we just seen last year. You have to be agile. You have to be able to respond to this. I believe that relying on historical data and on things that you've been doing in the past and the procedures that you got used to will just not work for you not for uh, deriving any optimization learnings from the data that are massively impacted by very unusual events like for example the COVID crisis or some other things that happened in the last decade uh, so on one hand side on the other hand side uh, you, you have to be agile. You have to be able to respond quickly to the changes that are happening in the market. And without having the solutions uh, at hand that allow you to be quick to respond to these changes very quickly, to refine your pricing strategy on the fly if needed, to derive certain analytics and learnings from the data that are uh, you know, today, that are telling you the story today and not based on, the, on, your, on your performance over the last few years, that are highly, uh, you know, uh, uh, noisy and, and unreliable, will be making a difference. And those companies that are ready for this and are embracing the the digitalization wave, including pricing and other, you know, solutions that are in in this in this area, will definitely be prepared to face the challenges of the future. And those who don't, they will be left behind. That's well put. Well put. 
So let's uh, let's look back a little bit and talk about. I wanted to capture some of the some of the stories of price effects, right? Ab about our origin story, which you talked a little bit about, about customer stories. You know, one of the stories that I often tell uh, and I'm asked to tell sometimes is about how I joined price effects and why I joined price effects. And you probably remember this, you know, back in I was 2015, right? And I, you know, we talked a lot about the platform and how flexible it was and how fast it was to implement. And I thought, wow, this is really something if, if it's as good as what they say it is, right? So I said, well, I'm not sure though. I'm gonna be a little bit skeptical, put me on a consulting project, right? And I actually signed up for helping with the implementation of an existing customer that was deployed in Central Europe and we were deploying a, them to the UK, right? So we were taking their Central European instance, copying it over to the UK and making the changes that we needed to. And I remember Steven and I had this workshop planned and we spent, I think we spent one to two days kind of preparing for it. And then we had a two day onsite workshop. And by the middle of the second day, we had, we were done with what we could do that they were able to make decisions on and done as in not documented what those changes were, but actually configured those changes in the system in one and a half days. And I, when I looked at that and I said, wow, with the other vendors that are in this space, this would have taken three, four months and cost, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars and been a ton of documentation. And we just sat there on the fly and documented you know, rather than documented, actually configured it in the software. And I said, okay, this is, you know, as good as, as what they say it is. So let's, you know, let's go. And, you know, the rest is history. So, um, but I'd like, I'd love to get some of your, you know, um, insight or your stories uh, about your, your favorite customer stories or your favorite price effect stories and kind of help, uh, you know, on our 10th anniversary, you know, help to uh, record some of that stuff for, uh, for you know, the price effects family and the, the extended uh, price effects family as well. Sure. And, you know, my favorite customer, there is no such a thing. All of my customers are my favorite customers. Uh, but I do have a lot of stories and uh, some of them are my favorite stories. But just the one which you just said before, right, is the story of disruption. This is something where we are, where we really committed ourselves to. And, you know, the the architecture of the of the solution that we created at the inception, and we work, we've we been working so hard for years, uh, you know, created this environment that is unseen, uh, you know, among our competition in the industry, where you can make changes on the fly, where you can apply changes, you know, from one uh, configuration to the other. And instead of writing documents and building, you know, uh, things and verifying things, we just move forward in an agile way in a very, very flexible configuration layer and deliver value, right? So. That's your story, my story, and as I said, there are so many of them. But I think one of the one of my favorite is another story of disruption that we actually brought to our industry that was unseen and unthinkable before we actually you know, showed up. And that's the story of us, uh, you know, providing our customers with extremely flexible uh, contractual terms. You know, before us showing up in the industry. Everything was perpetual. Everything was terms, uh, you know, time terms. It was, you know, three-year terms, commitments. It was, you know, you have to pay it for pilots. You have to pay it for proof of concept. You have to make commitments, take a lot of money into your hand. Applications were expensive. Implementations took years, right? It was, it was very hard to commit to a vendor. And once you committed, you were in this and you couldn't get out no matter, no matter what, right? And my favorite story is, is you know, when we were competing for, one of our very first early adopting customers that became, you know, history changing or game changing customer. They uh, they they run a big evaluation with all of our competitors in in the room and in the process, um, and we actually had been selected. And you know, at the day when and we were kind of getting the message that we had been selected, um, and you know, they want to go go with us. I returned back home, and uh, you know, as always in my career, when I was traveling a lot and and selling. You know, software solutions. Uh, my wife, you know, been waiting for me at uh, at, uh, at the airport. And you know, when I walked through the gate and 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 greeted her, first thing she she did when she looked in my eyes said, "Have they signed?" And that was just a you know a response to the to what she was used to. You know, my, my entire career, I was I was chasing businesses, and the only thing that matters was signature on the paper, because I knew that once they sign, once they commit to the perpetual license or the long term long term term license. They are mine, and uh, you know we we win. Um, they maybe win, maybe not, but they are ours, right? In this case, we knew because we were offering extremely flexible uh, uh, contract terms in the early stage of our of our 
business. We, we allowed customers to terminate on the monthly basis, which was unthinkable. And we actually didn't even ask the customers to sign up with us. They only could send us an email and confirm that they are uh, accepting our general terms and conditions, like you would be subscribing to the telephone line, mobile telephone line. We were in business. And the only thing that we wanted uh, them to, to keep them with us was their loyalty. So the extremely customer-centric approach that uh, doesn't require agreement. And when my wife you know, greeted me at the airport and said, have they signed? I thought for a moment, I said, no, and they probably never will. And there was extremely liberating moment where I felt, okay, we've created something unique, something very different, something very disruptive. And I think that was one of the foundation of our success. How yeah. does the story sound? That sounds good. Yeah, I, I agree about, you know, it's very customer centric view that that price effects has. And I think a lot of the disruption really came from that focus on how do we reduce the risk for customers, right? We saw the value being provided in this space, right? Which is which is immense. It's probably one of the most valuable enterprise software spaces that there is in terms of actually return on investment and being able to clearly illustrate that return, right? But the Gen 1 providers were just asking for all of these things, right? Commitments, all this money, all this implementation fee, all this time. And it, and it just required so much patience and so much risk and so much wherewithal to actually go through all that to get the first, you know, penny out of it. You had to spend, you know, millions of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so that's really what I see as, you know, the disruptive forces that focus on the customer and really coming up with a strategy and then a company and an, a platform that that reduces that risk down to the minimum possible you know uh, amount and uh, i think that's you know that kind of brings me to the next topic which is on this this customer centric culture that we have and and the importance of that you know i, I recently had david cancel who's the ceo of drift and is about a, i think he started five companies or something like this a serial entrepreneur really uh, well spoken and and great understanding of the things that have led to his success and one of the, those things has been really hyper focus on customer right almost to an obsession level right and he talked about this epiphany that he had had where uh he had been talking to an engineer and trying to get this change made forever and then what happened was he connected that engineer and actually had them do support and talk to the customer himself and the next thing you know, he was making that change that David had been asking for forever because he had that direct interaction and he understood the perspective. So he got that context, right? And he he actually understood the pain that the customer was facing as a result of this thing. And it wasn't a big deal, but he had been pushing back on it because, you know, he gets requests from all over the place. But when it came from the customer, you know, and so so part of what he, what he does, and I think part of what we do as well is really try to get as many people directly interacting with customers and understanding that. I know a lot of our innovation also has been, you know, customer led and customer focused. So can can you talk about how you, you know, how you went about building that culture and how you try to reinforce it and and maybe also the challenges with it as we get bigger, right? Because we're 400 people now, right? Yeah, you're right. And yeah, absolutely. I mean, customer centricity, everybody talks about this, but uh, in most of the cases, it's nothing but, you know, marketing slogan. And being really truly customer centric is is a challenge, and it's really not easy. And we actually really, uh, you know, declared customer centricity to be one of the founding principles of PriceFX. And uh, we were really, in fact, the first vendor in our industry uh, that based their entire commercial model on customers' loyalty. You want to be you want to be in business with us? Uh, fine, do it as long as you're happy. If you're not happy you are free to go, right? We're not going to bind you with anything else than your happiness, your satisfaction, and uh, and uh, and your loyalty. And that's what we really do. We did from the very beginning. That's why our commercial approach and legal framework were designed entirely around exactly that. You're happy, you stay. You have a value with us, you stay. You're not, you're free to go. And we actually will help you to migrate to another solution. Um, and you know, another you know expression of our customer-centric approach was that we based all of our uh, core of our innovation uh, from the very beginning on this on the concept that we called relevant r d um, and another one which we called good karma exchange and you're probably going to be laughing or your listeners will be laughing what the hell was i smoking before having this interview with you but yeah, it's true uh, you know it's not because my wife is asian and i kind of have a lot of 
um, you know, attention and, and sympathy for, you know, Asian culture. But um, we really did establish exactly that concept. So the R- relevant R&D, what, what this was about is, let's not be the guys who are trying to outsmart the market and outsmart our customers. Let's not be the guys who walk into the room, you know, polished and, you know, suit and tie. And first thing they, they tell the customer is like, Excel suck, right? And what you do today is might might not be the best thing. You know, you should try this, you know, try us, right? We we tell you how these things go and we tell you what is the next big thing. We are we are reinventing the future. Maybe that's sexy and it's kind of cool, but this is not us. We never wanted to be those guys. So we we were wearing t shirts from the beginning. We walked into the room and first thing we did, we listened. And we listened very carefully. And uh, we, with the assumption that what the customer does must be good because they are successful. They are in business, you know, 10 times longer than we are. And uh, and so what they do must be must be making sense. They might have challenges, but in the core of what they do, they, they are successful. So we listen to those challenges and uh, and everything what we could fulfill already with our existing functionality, we were. Uh, everything what was new and was making sense to us and to them, we took into our product roadmap and we were delivering this back to the customers at the speed of light. And, you know, believe it or not, um, I mean, you joined uh, the company, I believe, in 2015. You know, between 2013 and, and 15, 16, we had a release schedule that was actually every two months. So we've been releasing major releases every two, three months. And of, of, most of them were packed with innovation coming from our customers. So we were taking the, the, the requests, the needs from, from our customers and also partners you know, in, and if they were making sense in agreement with them, we were putting them into our platform, delivering it back to them. And that was the relevant R&D. We only deliver things that really make sense, that deliver value, that are of relevance to our customers. And that also created this good karma exchange that we, we told them, listen, this is good stuff. We will do it for you. Um, we will generalize it. We will deliver it as a very generic platform capability. Uh, that will not compromise any of your intellectual property. It means the way how you particularly do it, uh, this particular thing. But you will be able to configure this through the configuration layer to your likings without compromising your IP, and you're, getting, you're going to get this for free. So this is going to the product. You don't pay a cent for this. It's all available to you, but because it's valuable, we want to also make it available to others. And that was yeah. the good karma exchange, right? You You give and take. And the combination of relevant R&D and the good karma exchange, I think, made us, uh, you know, one, one of the aspects that made us so customer centric. And then the last thing is, you know, at the inception, we declared price effects to be a bullshit free free zone. And I yeah. think people really liked it. Yeah. Yeah. T- talk about the, the bullshit free. I know we've had a lot of conversations about that. And, you know, there's a differences in culture and, and, you know, where you could use that and not, we've kind of stopped using it. Uh, you know, I, I, I actually really liked it. And, but, you know, some of the salespeople here are like, well, I can't go into, you know, this environment and say that. Um, but tell, tell us about, you know, how, do you remember when you came up with that and like, what was kind of behind it? Oh yeah. I mean, I, it, it, it came up in my, inside of me for over years, you know, before incepting or creating co-founding price effects, I was working my entire career in, in software industry and somehow one way or the other always uh, involved in, in sales process. Um, and I am not very proud of this, um, but we, I was in my past overselling and under delivering. And that's what I call bullshit that we we've, we've been telling or promising more than we were able to, to deliver just for the sake that, that to make the business and to, to close the deal, to get the signature on the dotted line that frustrated the hell out of me. And, and when I when I freed myself out of this and, and took a chance to co-found and co-create price effects, I said from the very beginning, let's let this be a bullshit free zone, right? No lies, uh, no over promising, no overselling, uh, you know, absolute blunt truth. If it if it leads us to lo- losing the business, not closing the deal, so be it. Let's not deal with the consequences of us not being not being true. And right. uh, and I think people really liked it. They liked us yeah. being painfully honest and just not overcommit and overpromise. And what you right, rightfully said that we had to kind of abandon this officially, which although the, you know, unofficially this is still part of our culture, yeah. was when we moved to US. 
um, you know, it's amazing that, you know, in America where every second word is the F word, <laughs> Uh, you know, you cannot say on the homepage that price. Uh, work, our slogan was "Working with price effects is working in a bullshit-free zone," and we had it on the homepage for years. And when we moved to America, we had to remove it from the homepage. And that's kind of how it became more of a under the radar, you know, internal slogan and internal part of the culture. Right. Yeah, and I think you know a couple of things that you said there. You know, really reinforce it, right? When you talk about you know the flexibility and the the commercial friendliness of the way that we do business, right? There's really no reason for us to tell a customer that we can do something we can't do because there's nothing binding them to us other than providing value and actually delivering the things that we say we can do, right? Absolutely, I, we are we are allowing every customer to ter terminate uh, the agreement, no matter how long they committed to us at convenience. They don't want it. They can terminate a convenience. None of our competitors allows this. Everything is based on good cause. Right. Yeah. And I, and I also think the, you know, the customer centricity is key. But the the thing that I think price effects has gotten right is the combination of the customer centricity with what you talked about with the Karma Exchange platform, with being able to deliver that functionality and those capabilities in a way that's market relevant and can be leveraged by other customers in other industries. Uh, I, I can, you know, I oftentimes talk about different features and functionalities or capabilities that we developed for one specific use case, but we did them in a way that were broad enough to use in a completely different industry for a completely different use case. For, you know, like dynamic pricing, you know, we came up with for like retail digital commerce use cases, right? But then you can leverage that same capability in index-based pricing for process industries, right? Yeah. And so it's, it's uh, you know, if you have been through this, and, and I think that kind of architecture and that kind of foresight and the, and the way that, that the system is built really comes from the, those experiences, right? Of, of understanding, okay, maybe in the past, this has been delivered in a way that's, that's too narrow or that, you know, you just said no to a customer, but uh, really thinking about, you know, not only what the customer needs, but what the market needs and how that can be leveraged by other customers. That's really, yeah. I think, the key of building a good, a great software company, as opposed to, you know, some some of the companies in our industry operate more as like consulting companies with some software than actual software companies, right? And Absolutely. I'm not gonna get into everything that that means, but it, it's true, and I think you know it because you've seen the inside, of, you know, of both. And I think that's one of the things that at Price Effects, you know, we've always been very careful to 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 draw that line, right? And say, hey guys, we're a software company. We're not gonna, you know, and we're and we're gonna grow through our partner ecosystem and allow them to provide those consulting services on top and start to innovate as well. Now with with some of the the stuff that's coming out with Bain and some of our other partners, I think it's really exciting. Um so let's talk a little bit about innovation, right? Um I remember one of the early stories that you told uh, very early on, I don't know if you tell the story anymore, was that uh, there was a certain product innovation that made you so excited. Uh, and why don't you, I want you to put it in your own words though. Um, and what, 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 whatever you're yeah, comfortable I, saying I know, on, I know where... on the record here. Um, but uh, but I, I remember it very well. I could verbatim, you know, quote you on it, but I, I don't want to put you there. So why don't you tell the story? And then, then also it, uh, that would be a good place to start. And I also think about generally, the innovation and how that's a differentiator for us and some of the recent innovations that excite you. Sure, yeah, I, I know where you were heading, um, Gabe. You just do know too much about me and uh, you know, I can't hide anything. So yes, there was, this, uh, there was this thing going on in the company for a very long time that you know, when we innovate and we bring some really cool innovation, we call it uh, you know, uh, marching uh, almost pee in his pants, right? <laughs> Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm sorry for this expression, but <laughs> it is true that in a very early stage, you know, I think it was like three, four months after inception, um, our CTO and, uh, and, and my fellow co-founder, Christian, uh, has been left at home alone without family. He's a very much a family guy. So I guess he must have been frustrated, you know, to hell. And, uh, and he decided that he, it's time to, you know, spend this time on something really useful. And, uh, he came up with uh, something that we've been debating for a very long time. And you know this, Gabe, you know, you've been in this space for a long time. It's like one of the key challenges that companies implementing pricing solutions or any solutions of, um, of any you know, broader sense in a business is data, right? Integration of data and data cleanness and availability is, is such a waste of time and it's such a huge challenge. And some companies actually are giving up 
projects because they can't deal with the integration of data. And we knew this from the past, especially from the generation one vendors. And we, we knew we have to we have to re resolve this problem. If we resolve this problem, we're going to make a breakthrough. And um, and we've been thinking about this, how to how to get our hands around this. And we came up with two ideas. And one was, listen, what is the application in the industry that is the most adopted, accepted and widest used uh, business application um, on the planet? It's Microsoft Excel. Right. And uh, and what is what are the key attributes of Microsoft Excel? Why is it so popular? Well, it's intuitive, it's easy to use, and it's um, and it's it's friendly, and it's very very flexible. It has ton of disadvantages, right? And let's not get there, right? It it sucks in many in many aspects, and especially it cannot be used as a business application. But everybody who doesn't have the business application uses it because it comes as close to it as only possible, and it is very flexible. So mm -hmm. it's a very long introduction to this uh, to this thing to this innovation. But what happened is that Christian thought this through and said, why don't we replace our front end because we've been building the archi architecture, the application to be very flexible with the back end functionality as a platform and front end functionality that can connect to the to the to the back end through a very open I API and can be replaced by any type of uh, front end. He said, why don't we you know, bring those two things together and try to provide an alternative UI to our platform that would be a Microsoft Excel. And he spent a weekend on this. He built some special plugin and some special you know, functionality that could be injected to the normal Microsoft Excel installed on your laptop. And with this injection, it was turning it into the front end, connecting to our back end, establishing the connection, safe connection, and allowing you to exchange data while between the back end and the Microsoft Excel while protecting all of the meta data definitions, which means all the tables, you know, all the columns, all the columns names, the way, you know, the sequence of the columns and so on and so forth. Well, we're, we were able to transport them back and forth and interact with the back end through the, uh, um, through the Excel front end. And we called it the Excel client. And on Sunday evening, when Chris was done with the first prototype, he, he actually showed this to me and to Martin, the other co-founder, and I completely freaked out. He, he just opened it up. He was able to access the, the, the data, modify them, add formulas into the Excel front end, which modified the data and were updating the data in the back end and was able to show us how you can copy and paste from any you know, CSV file or another Excel, you know, hundreds or thousands of rows of data and just with one click, get them updated into the back end and with this create a proof of concept of pilot environment within a couple of days, which before was taking months, I, I just I just freaked out and I, I, I screamed out and and I told them afterwards that I was so happy that I almost peed in my pants. And that's that's how uh, how this whole thing, um, you know, stayed with us. Yeah, yeah, that's a great story. And I think it talks about, you know, the innovation, but also the flexibility and how we've, you know, really taken a pragmatic approach, right? And, and not, uh, you know, one where it's, you know, we're dictating what the right way is, but we're looking at how people are actually using software, how they're using other applications maybe around the software and how to really embrace that flexibility that Excel brings, but then fix some of the issues with it, like, you know, data cleansing and workflow and integration and these kind of things. So, yeah, yeah. I think that that's a great one. So let's let's talk about um, some but recent you also, I, I, I forgot yeah. Exactly. I forgot to yeah. answer the second part of your question. So yeah. sorry for this, Gabe. As, uh, you know, the recent, I mean, we are, uh, we we in, we innovate constantly. I mean, we bring a, per year at least two or three completely brand new products that are expanding the the footprint of our of our solution and our functionality. It's it's mind blowing, and it's really hard to say which of those innovations, the recent innovations, are my favorite because there's so much. But just last year, if you would just go through the list, you know, we 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 acquired, we brought up we brought up very early uh, in the year. The, ch the channel management or the, the ship and debit functionality as a, as a brand new module, full expansion to our platform capability. Just a few months later, we acquired, you know, an AI, phenomenal AI company, Brenner's Analytics in France, which we managed to fully integrate into the stack of our technology within less than seven months and, uh, and brought it to market as a, as a generally available solution in November. Right? We, we brought, uh, you know, to the market the Velo, uh, you know, functionality, the new, completely new um, uh, set of functionality that allows customers to manage 
um, the, the large deal negotiations uh, utilizing the, um, uh, the, the, the value uh, estimation approach, the VE approach, uh, something that is not existing in our industry. Um, it's, uh, it's something that is absolutely new, and I'm, I'm, I'm convinced it's going to be a breakthrough, uh, not only for us, but also for our customers who are actually adopting this uh, functionality as we speak. And that has been introduced to the market only in, in November last year. Uh, so just kind of counting those three or four, it's a massive amount of innovation. And uh, actually today, uh, we, uh, we are generally launching PriceFX Plasma uh, that has been born as a part of our second financing round, uh, where Bain and company, one of the three top tier consulting companies in the world, became our strategic partner and investor. And with them together, we started designing and developing and building uh, a brand new uh, benchmarking capability that's not existing in the industry. And it's allowing, allowing any of our customers uh, to get access to the big data that is managed currently on the PriceFX platform. Uh, where our customers are committing, uh, you know, data to the pool, which is anonymized, aggregated, actually double anonymized. Um, it's going through a very sophisticated, um, um, you know, um, massaging and changing and mapping. Um, and it's, uh, it's being enriched with data that is coming from Bain and company, and it's delivered back to our customers into the analytical applications to allow them to, to benchmark themselves against you know peers or similar sized companies or companies in the same industry or companies facing similar challenges uh, like for example price realization or uh, you know quoting uh, processing how long does it take to process a quote how many state steps approval steps do you take or other companies uh, and and how you compare uh, you know maybe you are having too many steps in the process and maybe that slows you down with releasing your quotes in the market and realizing the value from the from your customers, uh, there is multiplicity of different benchmarks and uh, and dashboards that we offering, um, and this is absolutely unique. So today is the day. Today we announced it. Um, if you are interested, go check it out on LinkedIn or our homepage or anywhere else. It's absolutely unique functionality, and it's going to be a game changer in the industry. I'm absolutely convinced about this. All right. Well, thank you very much, Martin, and thank you all for tuning in to Pricing Matters.